Sometimes ideas or names are linked together in our consciousness. I think about the wisdom of Abraham Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address, the government of the people, by the people, for the people. Each individual, one of those things would not be sufficient. It's the sum that gets at the wonder of American democracy. This sense of con uh, connection, of wanting to tell the whole in a condensed version is part of the mystery that we're entering into as we come to the end of Lent and are getting ready to move into Holy Week next week. For Patrick, the saint that we won't honor today in the, in the service, but we will observe secularly, for him, the, that con the concepts that were completely tied together were the Trinity. One and three, three and one. Patrick was about that. And the Trinity is a construct that both comes from Scripture, but also comes from our lived experience of God. God moving as creator, God redeeming us, God sustaining us, three in one and one in three. As Jesus is getting ready for his own death, coming to Jerusalem for a Passover, we encounter him in this morning's Gospel in John. And the writer of the Gospel of John has four concepts that are really tied together for him when he thinks about who is Jesus, what is he about, and what does it mean? For, for John, Jesus is the word made flesh dwelling among us. John has Jesus as a fully human being, and we see that reflected in this gospel this morning as Jesus talks about his spirit being troubled. Boy, we know that feeling of troubled spirit. We could almost say the spirit of the world is troubled as we gather for prayer this morning. Whether it's Haiti or Gaza or Ukraine or our families, we have troubled spirits as we look out at the nature of the world, as we listen to our friends, as we encounter strangers. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John doesn't want to stop there, though. The Jesus and the Christ that he comes to proclaim and illustrate has a deep sense of uh, death and suffering. His hour is coming. That's the way John will have Jesus refer to his death. He recognizes that this trip to Jerusalem is going to be his last hurrah and that he has no control over what's going on. Indeed, he's relinquishing that control to the powers that be. There are so many times in our lives when we experience that sense of powerlessness too, where there's an inevitability that's smacking us in the face that we have to choose whether we face it deliberately and with open eyes, or if we choose to close our eyes halfway to see a little bit of the truth, or both eyes so that we can be in full denial. Sometimes those um, occasions are when we discover uh, that our lover is unfaithful to us, and we've come across text messages that we should not have read, but we did. Sometimes those sense of, uh, that sense of coming to a crisis point happens with our health or the health of a loved one. You have cognitive impairment. We found cancer. You're going to need surgery. We go into those moments with dread and we try to muster confidence. Both are true. Jesus, as he is facing his death, 
knows that he has a certain amount of choice, but he's not going to exercise it that way because he's got a fundamental faith conviction. When these people are wanting to come and see him as the celebrity, he is focused on his death. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it cannot rise and have many come from it. There seems to be an awareness on Jesus' part that while often these crosses are gratuitous, they come out of nowhere and they seem not to make sense, in God's economy, they can also be vehicles of salvation and wholeness for us and for those around us if we make it so with God's grace. Unless that grain of wheat dies, it cannot rise again. In the Gospel of John, that's a deep conviction. You don't just talk about cross and death without talking about resurrection and new life at the same time. I think this is a really important point for us as Christians. In our culture that is becoming increasingly secular, and the Archbishop, I mean the Dean of Canterbury when he was here, Uh, last week was noting that in England, 3% of the population observes any kind of religious exercise on a regular basis. That as Christians, we're doing a countercultural thing. We think about death and resurrection as a peace. You don't die without rising. Death is not the ultimate in a life of a Christian according to the Gospel of John, and according to this Christian way of life. But we never talk about death alone. It's always death and resurrection. Those of us who have lived a long time with addiction know the power of that coupling. In the throes of addiction, we can feel despair, we can feel loss, we can feel overwhelmed with shame, and guilt and things said or left unsaid, things done or left undone. We can be filled with self-loathing and with the conviction to be able to walk a day at a time, a step at a time, looking for grace a moment at a time. New life and healing and wholeness becomes possible. Death and resurrection is a lived reality that we offer to others and that we give thanks for in ourselves. John doesn't want to stop there, though. This fleshiness, this death, this resurrection culminates in this gospel with a sense of ascension, that Jesus rises to share our human experience in the very nature of God, that our world and our lives and us are not abandoned and purposeless. That Christ is abiding in and amongst us. Patrick, in one of the poems that he wrote, captures this spirit deeply. He writes, Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. Christ is all around us and not us alone. As Christians, we are invited in this season of Lent Uh, to have a compound name in Christ, that we embrace our flesh, that we recognize the crucifixion in our own lives, the resurrection in our life, and the ascension and presence of Christ in our dailiness. This can feel evasive and elusive. We don't always have it emotionally. Instead, our faith is a conviction that it is so. Faith is trust. So as we come to this end of Lent, 
and enter into the mystery of Holy Week. I invite you to uh, acknowledge your fleshiness, to name the cross that you're carrying, the self that is getting uh, left behind, the self that is getting lifted up, and the places where Christ is with and above and beneath and around you. That in this Easter tide, we may be saturated with Christ. Amen.